Hi guys and welcome to a new video. Thanks for tuning in. So I think most people watching this maybe have never heard of FPV. But what I think everybody has heard of at this point is drones. More specifically, these cinematic drones, like the ones DJI sells. These gained massive popularity at this point because they are simple and easy to fly and not all too expensive at around a thousand dollars for the small ones and they produce some cinema grade quality video. Suddenly you don't need a helicopter anymore for these crazy shots but instead this flying 4K camera with stabilizers and a gimbal suddenly fits into every backpack. Or do you really don't need helicopters anymore? Because these drones can only go around 40 kilometers an hour and are not really designed to do any crazy maneuvers and dive towards an object or anything like that. So following a high speed object or doing any crazy fast camera motions is simply impossible with these things. They are great for slow area shots but not much more to be honest. That's where these things come into play. FPV racing or FPV freestyle drones. Some call them quadrocopters, some quads with a K and a W, but it all basically boils down to this general style of drone. On first sight, it even looks very similar to any normal cinematic DJI drone, simply without any covers and plastic around the whole structure. But there are quite a few key differences. First up, the thing that makes these things fun the power and thrust to weight ratio. So my drone can lift around 10 to 15 kilograms and this is basically on the very high end of performance you will ever need and ever want. But I wanted something insanely fast and this whole setup with camera weighs only around half a kilo. So you're looking at more than a 20 to 1 thrust to weight ratio. While these DJI drones usually maybe have around 3 to 1 or even 5 to 1 thrust to weight ratio. But that's because they have insanely big batteries for long flight time, a gimbal and a ton of other stuff and quite frankly these DJI drones never even need that much power in the first place since they can't go that fast anyway. So that's basically what these racing drones skip out on. These racing drones have the bare minimum to fly and record video. Second, freedom of control. The input FPV drone pilots use looks quite similar to what you use on a DJI cinema drone. But what the sticks do and how the drone behaves is actually a quite completely different story. See, cinema drones operate on GPS mode basically. Imagine the world as a space with a X and Y and Z axis. What the right stick on a DJI drone does is move the drone along its X and Y axis. And the left stick moves the drone up and down and can turn the drone around. Now you might think, yeah that sounds quite intuitive, you control it in every direction. And that's true. That's why they are so simple to control and can be flown without much practice. But to give you more freedom you have to take away most of the simplicity behind this. These FPV drones basically control exact like a helicopter would. And you might know that controlling a helicopter is not something you should or can do without any practice. And it's basically the same here and you will definitely crash a ton of times before being able to even hover in one spot. In the first one to four hours of your flight time your main challenge will be hovering in one place or making the drone go in the direction you want. So what we fly in is called acro mode. So what your sticks do is basically set the rotation speed. So if you pull the, your right stick all the way to your front, your quad will start rotating extremely fast. But once you return the stick to its center position, the quad will just keep the angle last set and will fly into the next wall or maybe straight into the ground. So basically removing the thumb from the stick in an unknown position of the quad will most likely end in a crash. So your sticks basically say how fast your drone should spin. To keep your drone at one place you constantly have to adjust. It's like balancing a steel ball on a plate. Imagine the position of the steel ball is the position of your quad in space. And now you basically control how fast you spin the plate. So to keep the drone in one place you need to constantly tilt the plate. And to move to one place and stop there, 
You need a ton of controlling and fine maneuvers. But with the drone you don't have an edge of a plate, so you will crash into an object at the end. If you don't apply constant controlling. Now we know what the right stick does, but what does the left stick do? You control the thrust. Now this might sound very similar to what you do on a DJI, where, you, where basically the left stick controls the height of the drone. But it's quite different. To keep a certain height, it's basically the same thing. You need to constantly increase and decrease the thrust to keep your drone at the same level. If you just keep the stick in one position, your drone will either fly to the moon or sink down until it hits the floor. Now, you can either go full mayhem with this and hit full throttle and catapult this drone with around 10 G's, which is basically five times as fast as any car on earth can accelerate across the place, or just apply enough throttle to hover a few centimeters above the floor. You have the complete freedom. What you can also do with this is fly backwards, dive down. You can do anything with this. The control is completely in your hands. And the only limiting factor of what you can do with your drone and where you can fly through with your drone is your own skill. Ah, let's film in this direction. I think it's quite uh, nice here. I actually wanted to fly over there, but uh, there were some people. Third, direct input. Now all the stuff I just talked about might seem crazy complicated, but it's actually quite simple once you get the hang of it. The problem is that this thing flies and learning something with, with a thing that flies and is prone to crash is quite an annoying and long process. But it only took me a few weeks to at least fly towards where I want to go. And around 10 hours to get to the point where, where I was like, yeah, now I can film stuff with this. And the reason for this quick learning process is the direct and almost completely latency free video output and signal input. I mean the radio input is almost never an issue with these things. All you have to transmit is two stick positions and what all these switches are set to. But video is a little bit more tricky. To keep stuff cheap, what FPV racers use is basically a analog video from old security cameras. These small cameras are basically cheap modified security cameras. You just feed them with 5 volts and they give you a one-wire analog video output signal. It's really that simple. You could basically connect that signal to an old analog TV or something. So drones like mine also have a video overlay on their flight controller, which basically overlays a battery status, signal strength and a few other little things on top of your video transmission. And then the video signal gets broadcasted by the 5.8 gigahertz video transmitter on the channel of your liking. It's only legal to send with around 25 milliwatts of power in Germany. But my video transmitter can be set to up to 800 milliwatts of power. So you get more range out of it and can fly further distances or behind more obstacles. But as you probably already know, I want to keep it legal on this channel. <laughs> Okay, now, now we basically have this video signal that gets sent out, but how do you even view the video? Like, what do you watch? A analog TV with a receiver? Uh, in my case, exactly that. You have a display that is hooked up to a receiver that can receive this 5.8 GHz video. And when talking about the video, you can't really say it gets sent. It's more a broadcast because that's what these video transmitters do. You select a video channel and they send the video on that channel. Now anybody within reach of the, of the video signal, which is maybe around a kilometer on open field with low humidity, can watch you flying. And what you see through these goggles is a very wide angle video directly from the board of the drone. When you're flying, you basically feel like you're sitting in the cockpit of this 
quadrocopter. And the video signal looks very much like a VHS tape or something like that. But it's cheap and it has low latency compared to a digital video, which could be higher quality or even higher range. But you almost always sacrifice some latency and low latency digital video equipment can be insanely expensive and is usually insanely power hungry as well. So digital video transmission might be the future for these FPV drones, but currently it's not the standard. It's too expensive and too complicated basically. So filming with these onboard cameras is obviously not so pleasant to the eye, because usually you just capture the video that comes in into your goggles. So what most people use is a GoPro with a 3D printed TPU rubber mount for the specific frame. I don't have a GoPro, but I have this big Sony action camera. Now my drone might look a little bit ridiculous, but it certainly works. So here's a little tour of my quite dirty and used setup. I want to start off this tour by saying I can't actually recommend the flight controller I got here. It was an absolute horror getting this thing set up. An incredibly annoying process since this thing doesn't work the way you get it delivered. But a little heads up for everyone who wants to build their own quadrocopter. You need basic soldering skills, quite a bit of patience and I would recommend sticking to a simple Joshua Bardwell drone tutorial. I will find a simple drone build video and link it in the description for you guys. And I would recommend building something very similar to what he does, since that would be a common and easy to build setup compared to mine, which is quite annoying and complicated to be honest. So yeah, stick to his tutorial if you want to build a drone yourself. I can't recommend it enough to you. So let's start off. My frame is a TBS Source 1. I use the Omni NXT F7 flight controller with integrated receiver. But don't buy that thing. It does not work and it needs soldering and a lot of annoying stuff to work. This Omni NXT F7 is basically the brains of this whole device which decides how fast every motor should spin and gets all the signals in and processes everything basically. Then I used the Holy Bro Teco F3 Metal 65 Amps 4-in-1 ESC. That's my motor controller, which has basically four different little motor controllers on one single PCB. This thing makes the motors turn and sends the power of the battery to the motors, wherever it's needed. Then I bought the Foxeer Micro Falcon camera, which sends a signal first to the flight controller, for the overlay and then to the TBS Unify Pro V3 which basically sends the video signal through a Lumia Micro XE antenna out into the world. So I have video and we can receive that. As propellers I mainly use the HQ Props 4.3 for 5 inch quads. So here's a funny thing and talked about this previously and here we are again. The same issue I've had with the VESC motor controllers and many different other things. This motor controller, this ESC, doesn't have a TVS diode. What is a TVS diode? A transient voltage diode basically eats up any voltage spikes and prevents damage to the ESC. So I basically added a TVS diode to the motor controller so that it doesn't die which is, to be honest, necessary for every single setup out there. Your motor controller will die one day or another if you don't have a TVS diode. If all the ratings from the MOSFETs and all the components are quite high, you have a higher chance of survival. But still, to decrease the chance even further, you should definitely always add a TVS diode. When choosing a TVS diode, mainly look for the breakthrough voltage. The minimum breakthrough voltage is above your fully charged battery. That's basically all you need and then buy the highest wattage rating and slap it on there. And that's not everything. I also added a fat electrolytic capacitor to get rid of any voltage ripples that could lead to bad video signals or even damaged electronics. So I fly six cells in series, a 6S, which is quite a high voltage, but I wanted to have an insanely powerful drone. And that's also the reason why I went for this direct fat ESC in the first place so that I could run more amps through it. 
And to get use of that, I also used some high KV motors. I bought these T-Motor F60 Pro version 3, 2500 KV motors. Other than that, I bought these wire extensions. I ripped some of them, but I will re replace them soon. A beeper, so that if I crash and the battery flies out, I can still find my drone. And I don't need much more. That's everything. Overall, the setup was quite expensive. It cost me around 400 euros and with batteries maybe 550. And let's say I would have started completely from scratch because I already had the goggles and the remote laying around. I would probably land at a cost around 650 euros. That's drone, goggles, video, batteries, charger, everything. And 650 euros for this hobby is quite a lot. But compared to a Mavic drone, which basically start at around a thousand dollars and are not able of achieving this type of stylish shots, this is actually a pretty cheap setup. But you can definitely go even way, way, way cheaper than this. I bought a really top of the class freestyle setup right here. With a more basic setup, you could start your FPV drone experience at maybe 200 to 300 euros. But honestly, if you want to make this your hobby, I can't recommend you enough to just buy things that fit your needs right away. It doesn't make sense to spend 200 euros on the cheapest equipment and then buy everything brand new again once you notice that your setup is not good enough for you and that you don't really enjoy flying with it. So that's almost everything I had in stock for you. I'm currently working on a crazy powerful new e-bike. I think you're really gonna like this one. It will be my daily commuter in the future and I'm super stoked to show it to you guys. I want to make a more detailed video about this, so I want to make more of a tutorial style video series about this e-bike. So tell me in the comments if you would like to see a more detailed and more tutorial style e-bike build series. I will basically build this e-bike from scratch. It's gonna be quite a simple setup, but a really powerful and amazing one. That's all for now guys. Thank you so much for watching. See you in the next video. Ciao!